also you have already started teaching yeah, the ideology? Yeah, yeah. so uh, week one, um, I, I titled the series Beauty All Around, and uh, week one was um, really just to lay a foundation for beauty's place in the Bible and the scripture. Um, is, is it a real concept? Is it how visible relative to what's beautiful? Um, last week, I really focused in on the God's work in uh, the nation of Israel coming out of, you know, hundreds of years of enslavement and creating a culture of beauty there and what he established in the, in the tabernacle. And, uh, the next two weeks, hopefully, are going to be a little more fun. Not that the first two weren't, but uh, I think it's a bit of a, a new gate for the church to go through. So, But I'm just really going to address what, what would this look like if we really opened the doors, um, our hearts and the stage, the platform to the artist? What would that look like? Uh, what would happen? So... Um, really going to just try and expose them to a number of things that... Um, some of which you brought before us in the, co in the course and some other things that uh, I'm just aware of. Um, and I, and I want to have a particular interest on, um, in, a, in showing them that there are artists very close that are amazing, um, amazingly gifted people. So um, I want to expose them to a jazz musician who is a Juilliard graduate. I want to expose them to a a uh, ballet dancer who, who uh, is a Juilliard graduate, and then um, a young man in our church also who has exposure with uh, um, um, brass, um, music education, um, outstanding performer, outstanding senior for university, state university here, and they're all from Tucson. Um, so I, I just want to say it's easy to it's easy to think that these that it's easy to think that artists are somewhere else. They're not near us. We don't have anybody like that. And I, I want to try and suggest that that's a myopic way to uh, view the world. And we need to be more aware of those people who are sitting right next to us or people who are sitting in our community. Um, I'm going to go back to a, a series that I did in the spring where I really tried to articulate who was living within one mile of the church. And I've done some number crunching relative to a study Princeton did back in 2001 on the number of artists in the country, um, made some assumptions relative to some population ratios and brought that into that one mile community, which suggests there are 194 um, practicing artists within one mile of the church um, through different, um, different expressions. So what would that look like if we open the doors to those 194 people? What would it look like if we could connect with even 10% of them? What would happen? So that's where I'm going for the next two weeks. It'll be interesting. Yeah, it's incredibly interesting and very encouraging and amazing. I went to La Triviata at the Denver Performing Arts Center with my family last Sunday. It was a snowstorm and it was beautiful. And coming out of the opera, there was a brass band playing just for fun, just yeah. for free, in the plaza. And of course, I started dancing down the street. And <clears throat> my family's very used to that. No one thought anything of it. But people were moving and processing and laughing. And to me, that was church. That drew me into the embrace of Christ and the joy of community, being in the center of Denver and all of the vital uh, um life force, the vitality and, and the hope for the future that that creates. And what if we brought that? What if, what if we just, if we were accepting and obedient to Christ and allowed him to open the doors to bring that within the context of church, what would happen? So I applaud you, Anthony. That's amazing. Well done. Well, I, hope, I hope one of the things that comes out of it, and I, and, and I want to be fairly lighthearted this week. I, I hope I can I don't want to back the church into a corner, um, but I just want to suggest, you know, lay, laying the laying aside our responsibility before God and the sense of stewardship that He's placed upon this, and and the fact that we're shutting people out when we don't do this. Just think of it as 
it, it makes church a lot more fun. <laughs> you know, it makes it a lot more interesting. And all of a sudden you look forward to going to church rather than knowing, well, here's exactly what we're going to do this morning. We're going to do exactly what we did last week. So I'm going to sit there and gnaw off my left arm. Oh. <laughs> you're enduring through the predictable so. you know taking a stand against a negative status quo is dangerous so yeah. I will be praying for you but it's absolutely necessary I've been doing this for most of my life and um, I can't imagine any other way to me it's a it's a dance to say what if we looked through this lens and lived in a wonderland could we push back the darkness? Could we defeat the evil? Could we subvert the decay? Could we be a force for life that, that will transform lives and cities? Absolutely. So don't worry about intensity. I, it sounds to me like you're a little concerned about being too intense. We, well, we need I, to no, no doubt your soon to be published book would have been helpful for me and <laughs> together, but uh, we'll, we'll do I don't know. We'll, maybe do maybe we can. not. We'll compare notes later. So. Right, well, I would also recommend um, Mako Yamamura's, Fujimura, sorry, Culture Cares. So we were reading Refractions. Right. Culture Care. I think I've got the mirror image up here, and it's, um, it's a study on beauty. Yeah. And he has what ifs at the end that are just stunningly beautiful. What if these things could happen within the context of the church? And not necessarily the institutionalized church, which is so conformist focused, but the church that is who we are as believers in Christ that populate the earth. We are the church. We are doing church right now. One, one book you put on our reading list that I just finished, it's a little thing, but I, I think it's great. And I think it's very, I think it's something I may recommend to people who come to me and say, you know, where are you coming from? Where are you getting this stuff from? Um, but it's Riken's little book on, um, now I'm trying to remember what the name of it is. But it's just about re recovering the arts, recovering the arts for the church. And I, I think that's um, not in recommended reading, but in it's um, an optional reading. It's an optional reading. Yeah. Right. It's recommended. It's, it's not required. Yeah. I've actually read it. It's in my library and I would recommend it definitely. Yeah. It's just a great short and sweet, um, very short, very Thank accessible. You. Explanation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Justification, theology, whatever. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll shut up. No, no. All right, well let's let's uh let's start this off, you guys. Let's um but let's pray. Krista, will you pray for us? Certainly. Thank you, Jesus, that we can be together this afternoon. Uh no matter where we are found, we can be together because of you. So we're grateful. Um Jesus, we're, we're eager to hear and see uh, what each one of us has created. Um, and so would you give us uh, open hearts, eyes, and ears to receive from one another today. Um, and we're also eager for what you are teaching us and what you'll continue to teach us. So thank you. And we love you. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all, before we launch into the PowerPoints and your images and all that you're doing for your midterms, any questions about the application papers, which are due, I believe, in 10 days? You have two options. One is to follow the syllabus, or your second option is to write a four-page paper um, relating to your PowerPoint presentation today. Any questions? Everybody? Really, just a, really just a housekeeping one, and, or sure. um, semantics. So, you want us to take that APA template and just save that as simply for this paper. So it's a, it's a four page paper with a title page essentially, and then references to follow. Right. Okay. So BGU is moving to APA formatting and they require that all written assignments utilize the right. template. Right. And it's just easier. It's easy. It's very nice. I, it's a great tool. I did great. not have the template in uh most of my graduate schools so this this is helpful yeah it's great it's great thanks and i recommend the apa manual sixth edition page 40 gives it all to you we'll begin with page 40 kind of just gives it all to you i don't think i even read the rest of the manual i just stayed with 40 through 50 and just used it as a reference 
So any other questions, questions about the applications right. paper or the I, final project? I have, all right, so the, Doctor, the final the application paper is different from the final project? Yes, the, this is, these are your visuals, your, the PowerPoints behind your creative midterm project. And the application papers are four-page four papers that can reference this presentation today. Or if you check your syllabus, there is a, an opportunity to write about the arts and city transformation. So it's your choice. As in, I'm not understanding. Two things, two assignments outstanding. The application paper are the, and the final paper. I don't know what you mean by a fine art paper. We have presentations and application paper, short paper, three to four pages is due. And that would be, that. I wouldn't have any more assignment outstanding, right? Well, then you have a final project that's due the end of the term, the end of December. Okay. So if you, if you read the lesson pages, there is an explanation, and if you read the syllabus, there's more explanation. And if you have any further questions at all, please don't hesitate to check in with me. And then our final um, Zoom meeting in two weeks, we will solely discuss the final projects okay. just to make sure okay. everybody's good. Okay, no. okay. Thank You're you welcome. for answering the question. Everybody good? All right, I'm going to pull up a presentation and screen share. Renee. Right. I'm going You're first. going first. Yeah, you know, that wasn't deliberate. <laughs> I just went with what was on my screen oh share. My uh, the first one on All my right, screen. No problem. Share. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My final, my midterm project, project, I look at a reflective artwork. Where the team share your views and experiences through the art. I'm clicking, I'm not getting. Are you trying to click? Do you want to go to, to slide two? Yes, I'm going to slide two, but I'm clicking and it's not coming it's got, I'll click it for you. Okay, thanks. The goal to empower and transform myself through my artwork so that, I, oh, I make some addition on my own, sorry, so that I can make healthy choices and become a better leader. By the end of my artwork, I will be able to teach individuals how to do picture collage and after which, they will be able to apply the transformational and art session and to be able to apply them in their daily life. From the teaching and learning sessions of my course, Healing the City Through the Arts, I create a picture collage to motivate myself and others that it will be used as a direction map for myself along with helping others. Core values, respect, responsibility, accountability, kindness, and service are the core values that I use to transform my life. I will be using arts as a tool to demonstrate the core values to the individuals that I will be working with. And that is the artwork that I, that I depict from Star and Night, the Right here, the butt job with Starry Night. Right here, where he display artwork, so I depict something that looking at his artwork, where he also talk about that he gives his all to art, and after which he was like seen as a mentally ill person. After he died, then his artwork um, sold a lot. And at the top, I look at core values, where I, we aspire and pledge to be the best. We take personal ownership and responsibility. We take pride in our workmanship. We celebrate the success of one another. We are world-class innovators. We listen to learn and communicate effectively. 
we have integrity and keep our commitments. We are professional in all we do. We have fun. We yeah, right. Sorry, we I thought maybe you moved on, Renee. Okay, okay. we're good. Click for me. Doc? Are you ready for the next, the right. next slide? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. So the artwork that you have just seen, I analyzed the posters where I said the poster has a captivating effect at first glance. The central team surrounding the 10 core values can be easily seen and radiant spirit of togetherness flows through, freely through the lines pattern which binds the different aspects on the posters together. Some of the vital institutions from society, such as the church, the home, the police station, and the school can be identified as group which are the foundation of upholding the core values. The colors truly reflect a mood of peace and hope. Youth work and leadership is the next level of centralism which can be observed. It is through constructive youth activities and involvement that many of our young people who are at risk can be reached. Healing through my own artwork. After reading the book, Refraction and Journey of Faith, Heart and Culture, I then create an artwork and through my artwork, I reflect and realize that the Lord will allow me to go through difficult times but I must not give up, and at the end, I will become victorious. I will continue to let Jeremiah 29, verse 11, be my guide. According to Hugh Dreamer, 2009, state 10, my artwork has healed my life in many ways, such as reduce my stress level and allow me to cope on my job. My artwork has allowed me to fulfill my purpose and walk in my God-given potential. I'm no longer a fear, fearful, but as Proverbs 28 verse 1 say, declare the righteous are as bold as a lion. I will also build a closer relationship with the Lord through prayer and worship and along with my artwork. Again, I've shown my, my co-workers, which they are teachers, to reflect on my artwork. Next slide. And this was evidence of their reflection that this person saying that this piece depicts a feelings of reflection of how they view the artwork. This is the next person that viewed, this is a male. He said that the artworks evoke emotion and thought-provoking situation. He talks about the uniform group. So he basically viewed the art as a positive feelings for him. That translating a positive and promoting peace. Next slide. This is the next reflection piece. The same person talking about that peace exists throughout the art frame and bringing togetherness. My students view on my artwork. The students mentioned that after they view the artwork, they felt different in their mind and want to think positive and work towards their goals. This artwork is healing to my students and also to the teachers because the students want to incorporate artwork in all of their classes. This is John making artwork strengthens problem solving and critical thinking skills. The experience of making decisions and choices in the course of creating art carries over into other parts of life. If they are exploring and thinking and exper experimenting and trying new ideas, then creativity has a chance to blossom. When students are encouraged to express themselves and take risks in creating art, they develop a sense of innovation that will be important in their adult lives. I strongly believe that art is a way to encourage the process and the experience of thinking and making things better. 
Right, and that's a picture with me getting feedback, what I read before from my students. This is my neighbor. So I was doing artwork in my community with my next door neighbor daughter to get in the feeling to see if she would have in the same impact, the same way or art impact my students and she attends next high school to see if it would impact her the same way how it impact my other students. So that was the picture collage that she did, talking about meeting and greeting. So make the community be um, welcoming and person we look out for each other in the community. She also said after doing the artwork, this makes you appreciate the art more and want to participate in her art class. My conclusion, I know from personal experience that the arts can be challenging. When I was trying to learn and master the picture collage, there were many times when I became so frustrated that I want to quit, but I did not. After practicing hard, I learned that hard work and perseverance pay off. The artwork have built the students' confidence. There is something special about participating in the arts. As the student improve and see their own progress, their self-confidence will continue to grow. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Renee. You have, uh, you have a very rich presentation there. Feedback, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to say that I appreciate that you chose collage because it's an accessible art form and and yet I feel like it's hard to make collage not beautiful. So whether you're whether you self-identify as an artist or super skilled or not, it feels like an accessible an accessible art form and still creates great beauty. And so I yeah, I think well well done in choosing that Thank art form. You. I thought it was good that you took the you took your art to a lab, so to speak, and got feedback on it, got people involved in it. I think that's a great it's a great natural next step. So I applaud you for doing that. And hang Thank on. Renee, I applaud the uh, reference to the hard work of art and not to give up. I also appreciated your statement about God allowing hard times in our lives, <clears throat> that he does this for many, many reasons, and they're all good reasons. And that doesn't mean he doesn't love us. In fact, it's an indication that he does love us. And I think art helps us reflect on core issues in life that help us to deepen and grow. And your presentation reflects this. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? I just, uh, I also appreciate how you're able to articulate those core values so clearly and the really I, don't know, I, I felt quite inspired in that moment by your core values and then how you conceptualize them in the collage. So. And Renee, I would encourage you to reference your resources for some of these statements. They're all profound and powerful and it to back them up with references. Okay. Is, is it, at the doctoral level, it's absolutely necessary. It's required. So you have the information you just need to provide where you where the original thought originated okay okay we ready okay natalia all right this one's mine um, are you right. up because I have on my screen, I have the end of 
Chris, is yours up on your screen? Yes. Okay, because I still have Renee's on my screen. So I have to... I can see the new one. Okay. All right. Um, can, uh, can you see it? Uh, do I have control in doing you the do slides have, or can you, you see the you new one? You should have control, but Renee's, it should be on the right side of the screen. You should see towards the bottom. You should see um, options to control your slides or I can do that for you. Um, all right, so um, I decided to uh, kind of do, do some theological reflection on a creative uh, um, thing that we do on a regular basis with our students and it's called a prayer tasting. Uh, it's in French, so it's la dégustation de la prière. Um, and it was inspired by uh, the book Pray Like a Gourmet, created one of my uh, best friends uh, is her dad and he was a missionary in Montreal he and his wife then uh, moved to France and he's an artist. And so he's technically a church planter with the Southern Baptist, but his churches would be the most out of the box churches you would ever know. And so prayer is really at the center of his, of his ministry. Um, so you can go to the next slide. All right, so um, when we started planting ministry on our colleges, um, kind of based out of um, a, a report that was, or a research that was done by several campus ministries, uh, denominations and youth ministries. Um, they produced a report called Hemorrhaging Faith in 2001 um, and uh, about the, the mass exodus of young people from the church in Canada. And so uh, through that report, um, the main thing that came out was uh, young people are falling through the cracks and particularly in times of transition. So when they go from high school to college, um, in Quebec, they would have another transition from college to university and then, uh, and then university into the workforce. That at those transition points in their lives uh, is uh, where a, there's a huge attrition of young people in the church. And so uh, the report talked about that some staggering number, like 95% of young people who used to attend church in middle school will no longer do so by the time they graduate from university. Um, or it was 80% in Canada, 95% in Quebec. So um, uh, then just this past year, they came out with a new report called Regenerating Faith. Um, and about, it was in response to hemorrhaging faith. And uh, it, it, the thing, it's what we all know is that uh, young people need the people of God to be in, particularly in those times of transition, to be mentors and leaders and resource them at these places of great stress and anxiety. And so um, in, uh, in universities in Canada, about 30% of students struggle with a diagnosed mental health issue, usually anxiety and depression. Um, and so I write, as they leave the church, they're being cut off from the resources that will connect them to the healing power of the Trinity. And as they fall through the cracks and encounter huge obstacles without the tools to flourish, then they will languish. So um, when we started planting ministry, uh, we knew these things to be true. We were encountering it even more in Quebec. Um, and so uh, we decided that if we wanted to develop leaders, we needed to develop leaders who are going to have lives that were deeply entrenched in prayer because if you want to follow the master you got to know where the master is going um and so the, the artistic process through these prayer tastings has the potential to birth new life in these young people either in the places that are fallow or in the places that are stagnant um and so just recently we did a prayer tasting and i'll get into what a prayer tasting actually is but we did one with our church uh, in another city in quebec and uh um, one of the women, women came up to us at the end and she said, I, I feel like you're restoring something that's lost with young people in doing these prayer tastings. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So um, in uh, Pray Like a Gourmet, David Brazil says, in culinary circles around the world, many people are now pushing back and taking their time to peel, chop, and cook locally grown food with their own flair. 
we, uh, we too, sorry, there's a typo there. We too can push back and engage in seeking authentic calm and refreshing nourishment for our soul. Each of us, of course, with our own flair. Uh, and so he, he writes a book about how to develop a prayer life like the French relate to their food. Um, and so as opposed to this, like, the way, he, so he's American. So he talks about how Americans relate to food is fast food nation. So everything is quick, easy, and unhealthy. Um, and it's not an event, it's you eat to eat. Um, whereas now as a missionary in France, with the French, it's an event, right? It starts at six and you're still going strong with the cheese at midnight and you just stop all things to actually be around the table with people to, uh, to taste all the wonderfulness of food. And so he says it actually ought to be this that we're born knowing how to pray. Um, but then that kind of fosters this very uh, functional relationship with prayer. And so instead, he's developed these prayer tastings to help people uh, develop deep, rich, and unique ways of communicating with the Trinity. Um, and so a prayer tasting uh, basically is, when we do it, we have five courses, three of which are food and two are prayer. And we pair the food with the type of prayer that we want to teach to the students. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, so when we, when we start, to, when we plan a prayer tasting, we ask the question, what do the students need? Um, what is it that they, they need to hear from Jesus or to know how to communicate to Jesus? And then we build the menu. Uh, so if we decide, if we, if we discern that what the students need is to, um, to develop a listening ear in prayer, as opposed to always being the one in talking, then we'll choose a prayer practice that is going to be contemplative and, um, and put the prayer in a position of listening as opposed to in the position of teaching. And then we will find food <laughs> that we think actually pairs well with that type of prayer and etc. So next slide. Uh, so the, the one we most recently did was uh, an Indian feast, um, and it was, uh, the theme was all about uh, the visual. So we started with, um, and everything is made from scratch. It's, it's really important that the, the food have the quality of the prayer relationship with the Trinity. So we made pakoras from scratch with the tomato chutney. And then we did a litur liturgical call and response prayer out of Psalm 136. And one, Psalm 136 is about his love endures forever. And it tells the story of the Israelites. We chose this Psalm because we're in the midst of studying Exodus with these students on campus. And so then they can picture the story that's being told in the Psalm. Then uh, we went with a vegetable and lentil curry and a chickpea dal with fresh cucumber salad, rice and naan. And so it was all about color. Um, uh, because the prayer, uh, the, the main course of prayer was a prayer called Visio Divina, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, and then we finished with a coconut pudding and fresh fruit. Before us, then we'll move to the living room and do our Psalm 136, move back to the dining room, have our feast, living room, Visio Divina, and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so next, uh, next slide. So that's our little dining room set and ready for the students. Uh, there's a peace lily in the, in the window. Um, and so I, I uh, started interviewing some of the students who've been coming to ask them about these prayer tastings, what compels them to come, uh, why, why is creativity important, and et cetera. And so um, we, we have a deep value for a ministry of hospitality. So we have an open door policy and students can come and go and through our door and through our kitchen and through our fridge door as much as they would like. And so one student, she said, um, you know, the dinner table is a gathering place where we come together, share about our days and share about our lives. And so she was, she's part of what compels her is actually the hospitality of it, where there's people of different, from different colleges. This is an intercollegiate group. Uh, so people she would not meet otherwise and that she would not share life with otherwise. Um, but there's something about being around the table together that, um, that is, uh, developing her relationship with Jesus. Uh, next slide. 
So this is just to whet your appetites. Um, and so the, it's important for the food to be beautiful uh, because again, it's meant to inspire a life of prayer that is beautiful. So fresh ingredients, everything made from scratch. Next slide. Here's the pakoras. I was just, I was rather pleased with how they turned out. Um, also, I'm uh, gluten-free and dairy-free, so I always have to find things that will also work with uh, dietary restriction. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the Visio Divina, uh, that should say Divina, my apologies for the typos. Um, so Visio Divina is a, it's a visual prayer practice. So it actually um, uh, print out images and they might be images that I found from the internet or photos that I've taken of just like things that have inspired me. Um, and then, and then it's, a, it's a contemplative practice about allowing the, the picture to read you. So if you're familiar with Lectio Divina, Lectio Divina is about allowing a biblical text to read you as opposed to you reading the text. Visio Divina is the same idea, but you allow the picture to read you. Um, and so it has five steps um, that are all listed here. And it's, it just goes through a series of questions of what are you drawn into in this picture? What emotions are, are, are aroused in you? Meditate back to Jesus, um, you know, and how will you apply this uh, in your life? So if you go to the next slide, this is a picture that I have visio divina a lot uh, in the last four years where I have uh, experienced drought in my life with Jesus or life in ministry or, or wherever. Um, and this image has spoken to me deeply because it is stark um, and yet still beautiful. You can see little moments of growth even in the cracked earth. Um, and so I would use this image and go through the steps and, and allow a conversation between uh, the Trinity and I through this picture. And uh, so the last slide is a bit around um, as, uh, interviewing students to ask them, uh, particularly around the, um, that, is, uh, that is igniting things in them. So there were, there were two questions around creativity. Uh, one was, um, what role does creativity play in these things? Creativity is important uh, for this generation and its redemption. So Marianne said, uh, creativity breeds curiosity, and that leads us to discovery, which is how we encounter Jesus. Uh, this student is so intriguing. She is a, she's a practicing Catholic with a very vibrant uh, relationship with Jesus. We've just met her like a few weeks ago. Um, and she's rocking our worlds a little bit. And so she's, she's understanding that uh, this generation uh, needs to be curious in order to encounter Jesus. And creativity is something that actually breeds that. Then uh, Naftali said, uh, in an ever-changing and transient world, creativity allows us to keep up. Um, it... Uh, it being different is so it being the prayer tasting uh is what is attractive and that keeps us moving towards jesus and so she she is seeing the importance of um of uh being open to change and actually pursuing change in order to be pertinent uh to this generation and then uh, finally uh, Fridili said uh, creativity not only keeps our faith alive but it can also unlock something new uh, and so the, for her, the prayer tastings, uh, like she is a Montreal-born Haitian woman and goes to a Haitian church. And so she really appreciates single tradition. Um, I mean, like many of us do, right? We have a single tradition that we've grown up in and, and practice and then can encounter uh, a whole world of new that then can unlock something new. And so it creativity combats stagnation in our, in our relationship. And then of course, all of them said, we love food. So, you know, uh, millennials are foodies. They love food, anything food related. 
Um, but it is the generation that cares about quality of food. So they don't care about McDonald's. They care about the locally grown organic produce with the, you know, or if they're not vegan, that the chicken was well treated and has a name and, you know, yada, yada. Um, and so they, uh, they um, are drawn in by the culinary experience as well. And then again, because at home they might always eat the same thing uh, or they get to taste something new uh, culturally. So some of them had never had Indian food before, um, but they're game, they're game to try it because that's actually a value of their generation is try something new. So that was my project. Nicely done, Krista. I think the art of food and the art and beauty of prayer is life changing. It's humanizing. We all love kitchens and we go to someone else's house. We all love to hang around and watch the food be prepared. And then we love to sit down at the table and break bread together. How within the context of the larger community, the cities, is this process healing and transformative? Uh, one of our hopes, is, like right now, we um, we only have uh, college students who self-identify as Christians who come to these tastings. Uh, we would love to for that group for whoever comes uh, to diversify. Um, so I actually think this is a way people can encounter Jesus for the first time, or identify the Jesus they've already been following, <laughs> but you know, know the name. Um, and then, and then the table is kind of that leveling ground. So people of different walks of life and faith of socioeconomics of education of whatever, uh, can gather around the table. Uh, so one of the places we've seen this is we've been traveling to our different churches, support church, supporting churches to do prayer tastings with them as a way to bless them with it, but then also share about what's going on in our ministry. Um, and so then you have people uh, in these churches who are at various levels of, of all things, um, but sharing in prayer together, sharing at the table. Um, and so that's been, that's been really neat. So, so that's one of the ways that we, we could see this having a, a more citywide kind of impact, I guess you could say. Well, we need to be brief because we want to give time for Anthony to, do, to present his PowerPoint. Any brief comments? I was taking notes, Krista. <laughs> I, I, th this is great. And I, I um, should get this book. <laughs> I am. I, I, I made a note. Um, so I have a Southern Baptist background. So I'm always curious when Southern Baptists demonstrate creativity. It's not something I think we do well most of the time. Um, so that's great. And, and, and I really liked the, the analogy, you know, food is a metaphor for prayer is great and i was thinking you know jesus talks mm -hmm. about heaven in terms of a banquet and and that's something that i don't think we know how to do we know how to potluck <laughs> or we know how to fast food but we don't know how to consider what eating at heaven's table might be like mm -hmm. and it's probably not going to be mashed potatoes um, it's going to be something else so i, I thought it was great take a note really creative uh, really relevant thanks we ready to move on? I thought it was very creative too. In fact, that's a problem that a lot of churches have with the kids leaving the church after they get, you know, it's a real major problem. <laughs> Not just in Canada, but in the US too. So it was a good idea. It was great. Very creative. Thanks. I think the presentation, my time to talk? Go right ahead, Renee. Right. I think. Krista, I think the presentation was very creative. It really impacted my life a lot because, I mean, the way you prepare the food, it was very creative. And, you know, when you're going to God, you have to give God everything. So being, and I was making notes also, where you talk about the Ministry of Hospitality, that the table brings togetherness and to get closer with God, we have to get in touch with anything that we're doing and talk about the power of creativity. And one student mentioned that creativity not only keeps our faith alive, 
but also unlock something new. So when it unlocks something new, then you get to relive, rejuvenate and start something fresh. So it was a good presentation and I learned a lot from it. And especially when I look at the coconut pudding, I like coconut pudding. <laughs> I can send so you the I was, recipe. I was really running. <laughs> I really like pudding. So, and also when I mention about the mental health mm -hmm. and seeing it, it, it really brings creativity and person can relive and restoring the, the loss. So keep up the good work. Mm, thank you. Uh, just a little side note, I'd be happy to um, send you sample menus of all the courses, prayer and food, or if you guys want a, yeah, really a more broken it. down form of how to do one, I'd be happy to, right, really. to coach you through how to do one. Thanks so much. Anthony. Is your slide up? Yes, I just had to unmute myself. <laughs> Seldom a problem, but it is with technology. So, um, I, when I sat down to think about what to do, um, considering what my capacities were, I decided to draw. And, and so my effort is a drawing uh, with pastels, and we'll come to that at the end. But it really is about um, using the arts to help a community re-envision a problem and rethink about who it is. So it's about the relationship of an icon within the community to a community's self-perception. And my thinking is that you can try and fix the problems in the community. That's a good thing. You can attack the community, if you will, on a number of fronts at the same time, or you can focus on what is the problematic icon that everyone who knows the community tends to think about when the community comes up. So um, my project is about exploring the solution to that problem using uh, the idea of light and about addressing the iconic distress of an intersection in the town where I live, an intersection of the Alvernon and Grant. Next slide. So this is an intersection. If you were to look at it on any given day, these are the kinds of things that you would see. Uh, business owners and events that are not redemptive or helpful for communities. Uh, it is in general an intersection that you would like to avoid um, from the uh, uh, loan sharks that take advantage of people when they're down to um, the traffic violations, the violence, the accidents that occur there. They also have a problem with business closures. Businesses have a hard time staying um, open there. Uh, Walgreens went in and I thought, well, where does Walgreens not make money? Where can you not put a Walgreens in the United States and make money? Because Americans have to have their drugs, legal or illegal. Um, and but they went out of business. They had to leave. Um, Fry's is a grocer in the Tucson community, in the Arizona community, actually, that <clears throat> has a kind of a rep for being a, a blue collar grocer, if you will. They, you don't typically find Fry's in well to do communities. Um, but even Fry's went out of business there. They could not, they could not make it. Um, and the Tucson community has a rather dim opinion of this, this intersection where Alvernon hits Grant. Next slide, please. So I just pulled some comments from various people. I, I won't read them, but <clears throat> you can scan them. Terrible scum, villainy, weirdos. These are the things that um, come out of people's mouths as uh, you do a little looking around public opinion on the internet, how they feel about the intersection. Um, next slide. If um, you did some research into how the intersection was viewed uh, <clears throat> by news-based organizations or 
public opinion groups, it typically ranks at the top of the list. If you're going to fix an intersection, if you knew how to fix an intersection in Tucson, Arizona, Alvernon and Grant is the big one to fix. Um, and, and, and there are problems spatially with the intersection. There are um, pedestrian problems at the intersection. There are closed businesses at the intersection. There's violence at the intersection. You know, pick one. I, I don't know there's a good functional way to address the problems. Next slide. Um, the Tucson Police Department has a, a relationship with the intersection. Um, I spent some time in conversation with TPD and particularly Corey Doggett. He's a lieutenant that handles a lot of PR for the police department in that area. Um, it's interesting how the Tucson PD divides up its officers. It divides them up by sectors and the sector is typically um, about uh, 12 square miles, 12 to 14 square miles. And at any given time, there will be seven police officers assigned to that quadrant. So that means that if I call a police officer to come to my house because somebody stole something from my back porch, there's one less police officer able to problem solve for that sector. That means if a police officer encounters somebody who has a mental illness on the road or homeless person, they have to spend time to find a place for this individual uh, there's less police officers to to respond to the needs of the community as they are represented uh, in that sector. So uh, again, even in the police thinking, Grant and Alvern on way is a problem for them on a great many levels. Next slide. And in the words of Lord, uh, Lieutenant Corey Doggett, I just thought this was priceless. He just smiled and said, we spend a lot of time there. Um, and to me, it's, it's just, he said, you know, police officers want to be problem solvers. That's what we want to do. Um, and we love it when the community can get involved and we can have conversations. But that intersection is a problem. And it takes a lot of our time. We're always there. There's always something happening there. Next slide. Again, um, what I'm about to show you is within the context of the intersection, but it actually is my interpretation of that center picture. So you're essentially standing in the middle of the Alvernon Grant intersection and you're looking north down Alvernon. I'm sorry, you're looking south down Alvernon. What you see on the right is a bus stop. Uh, an earlier image showed that bus stop twisted and disfigured and torn across the street. Behind you is the lone title place. And, and this bus stop is usually a place for just about any type of humanity you might want to envision. It's always there. Uh, there's quite the variety. It's just not the type of place that I would get excited about hanging out with my family. Interestingly enough, if you could see it in, in the distance, uh, the church that I'm a teaching pastor at, it, it, is at is almost at the end of that line of sight. It's before the next light, but we are not far from this intersection. So I feel like this intersection falls within our stewardship relative to our community ministry. Next slide. So the idea is what if we brought images of community color and hope to a troubling icon in the Tucson community? What, what, would it be more impactful, rather than trying to attack this on a thousand fronts, if we created a series of images at this troubling, iconic intersection that allowed people to begin to reconsider what that community was all about and to re-envision it as a place of resources and a place of joy and a place of hope and a place of solutions rather than simply as a place of trouble? So um, I'm not an urban planner, I'm not an urban designer, but my idea is to have a series of uh, metal frame um, sculptures, if you were, that, that, have, that have an upward lift to them at the top. So you see these slope from the right to the left and they pull the eye up 
Um, and on these would be placed images or graphics, colorized, hopefully, but that would be of resources, of places of beauty within the community that people might not even be aware of. So it's not about, it's not about, the idea here is not about bringing something from the outer world or just putting cool pictures. It's about saying, hey, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but within 250 feet of this intersection is one of the great beauty spots um, in our city, and it's the Tucson Botanical Gardens. And so that first image is of the Botanical Gardens. It's right there. Did you know it was a place of beauty and a place of light? And it's right here. The second image is an attempt to just simply capture uh, the presence of refugees. Refugees are seen as a problem in the community, but I actually see them as a great resource of solutions because they're survivors and they're brave and they're courageous and they're willing. And so to, to recast an idea, an image, a feeling about the presence of refugees, um, there are 25 different languages spoken in J.B. Wright Elementary School, which again is just a half a mile from this intersection. And that can either be seen as a problem or it can be turned into a resource. And I think the right imagery at this intersection might begin to change that perception. And then the final graphic, just an idea, but an image of musicians from the local community, whether that be high school musicians, the jazz band from Catalina High School, or perhaps local jazz groups or musicians that exist within the community. But I, I think we could present these um, featuring a number of resources from the community. We have some other things. The site of this, I didn't know this, the site of the second largest public Holocaust march in the United States is half a mile from this intersection. I didn't know it was there, but it happens every year. Um, Iskashita is an incredible refugee group in the community that does urban harvests from, um, from all over Tucson. And they basically go down alleys and go on university campuses or business campuses and harvest things from trees that people just watch fall on the ground and rot. Uh, but these refugees come in and know what to do with that and turn it into some incredible food. So that's all the background. That, that's the context for the picture itself. So let's go to the picture. So um, the iconic shapes are important here because the idea would be to place three of these behind each sidewalk at each corner of the intersection. So there'd be actually six of these on each corner. So a total of 24. And so imagine coming down the sidewalk to these places, and I've chosen not to try and draw them uh, for more than one reason. I've chosen to just deal with the idea of light. So let the white space in the picture suggest that in an intersection of darkness, there are these icons of light that all cause people to look and ask, What's that? Where is that? is that? Is that in our neighborhood? What is that? So to create conversations at the intersection, physical intersection, but a thought intersection, a, re a, a, a redemption intersection, uh, to begin to transform a community. And so if you follow the line of sight from right to left, in the background you see our church, and you see more of these, three more of these, and you see our little white church sign. And I would envision the church participating in this and becoming a thought leader for other organizations in the community as they invested in these, in these images of light as well. The difference between these at the, at the intersection and the ones at our church would be that ours are Christ focused. So it's a beginning of a way to take, you know, the ancient idea of stained glass, but move it out on the street and provide Christ in color, Christ helping people in color. Um, so, um, so on a personal note, um, this is the first time in 25 years I've picked up anything to draw with. And um, just, just two observations. One is, I, I had more fun than I thought I would. Um, and, and the second observation was maybe a little bit of a moral I found that far more than the picture, I just actually like the textures of the pastels on the page. Uh, so um, 
I, I, and I think there's a lesson there. I think beauty can be appreciated at a macro level and at a micro level as well. You can enjoy the picture or you can enjoy the textures of the picture. And I just known that to be true with drawings or paintings, especially I'm a Van Gogh fan. So I love the heavy paint. I love the qualities of the, of the canvas itself, but kind of rediscovered that here. So I hope, just talking about my preaching at the beginning of the class, I, I plan to use this really to wrap up my series. And um, as I said, I, I'm, I'm here taking this stuff because I'm going from kitchen to table. I, I want to go straight to application. So um, sometimes it's not baked or fully ready, but that's the intent. So uh, thank you. I'm done. Questions, concerns, objections? You know, Anthony, we haven't talked about art as spiritual warfare. What you are doing with your vision is your goal is to subvert the decay and the darkness and the negative energy of that area of the city with the creative power of heaven that heals and transforms, that renews and helps people to rise up. Yeah, to and me, this is... It's an interesting observation. It, it, to me, it's anti-terrorism. So, you know, 9-11 exactly. was about bloodying America's economic nose, an iconic fist to the face. And this is just the opposite of that. It's about striking back with something of beauty at a place where ugliness tends to reign. So. Well, I love it. I love it. I would just, I would just get some, some of your prayer people on this. Because if, when you have an area of the city that is subjected to such intense decay, sometimes there are spiritual strongholds. Sometimes it can be a result of, of, of the history of that area. That it's usually a result of the high crime that invites kind of a negativity into the area. And this is exactly what the church needs to be doing and artists is to run into the arena of decay with God's beauty and his truth we just have to have our armor on Ephesians 6. And I thought, I thought one of the reasons I was excited about Brian Bakke's presentation was I thought that's a guy I need to listen to because mm -hmm. I, I bet he's got great counsel to offer on stuff like this. The other piece, I think all three of these presentations have been phenomenal. Just it's so important to refer to your empirical evidence and to reference appropriately where the ideologies are coming from and so many of them are probably in your heart and soul already a lot of them we have worked with in the course and just reference just give some reference to other um, evidence that supports what you're saying that's especially important for your applications papers and your final projects so any comments on this amazing idea to bring healing and beauty and God's glory to a part of Tucson. I'd love to hear in, in you know, so we, another year from now, another six months, how it's working, that'd be great. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Anthony, your artwork is very um, touching. I did have something similar to that artwork that I did want to bring up, but I didn't know how to really depict it because I went to my city, which is the art of downtown city, where it is a bloody city, Kingston downtown. And I was taking pictures of persons on the street side and doing painting to try to incorporate in how I could transform the city. But I wasn't getting the feel of how I could put it all together. But Listening to your presentation bring a whole art opening up to me that we're good and evil coming together to to um to uphold one aspect and especially where the police play a vital role also in the community during an event with injured person can be driving at a speed limit and person lose their life. And the way you depict it in your setting that they're bringing healing in the community that 
no matter what you're doing, you're going to have good and bad person living in a community. It also reminded me, Anthony, of the, um, the TED talk that we watched about the two uh, Dutch artists in, who were in the favelas in Brazil. And um, like both the bringing of beauty into the neighborhood, but also function. So, you know, the, those artists, they, it was like plastering the, the homes and painting them so they're actually finished and, and livable. And, and yours that actually pointing to resources of, of rest and peace in their own neighborhood uh, that I, I really loved and was bringing me back to that TED Talk, which was so inspiring. And so then yours was also inspiring me in the same way. And your drawing is beautiful, like it's very captivating and I love color. So you nailed it. Thanks. I, I was struggling. I thought, you know what, just, just make it colorful. Don't worry about making it accurate. So. Pastels are fun. I love pastels. Yeah, they are. They are messy, but fun. Yeah, they are messy. <laughs> Well, everyone, we're, we're way past. These were phenomenal presentations. I'm very pleased. And um, so continue working on your applications papers and your postings and um, your final projects. Renee, I need your final project proposal. If you, again, I know that you have been, you have not had um, access to a computer. So when you do, Go ahead and just read the lessons pages and it'll bring you up to uh, where we are on the final projects. <clears throat> and Renee, will you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, I come to you one more time, Lord Jesus. We want to thank you for the presentation that my classmates have shared was a beautiful presentation. All of us have different um, perspective, but working towards one goal. We want to bless our lecturer, Lord Jesus, as she continue to guide and support us along the way. Lord, I just want to say that I'm happy that someone could have loaned me a computer today so that I could get to do my presentation and to share and I'm also on sick leave and I just want to thank you for the strength that you're giving me and having this discussion with my classmates. It's been strengthening my life for me to continue to stay focused. So I just want, as we're going to depart, Lord, just guide and protect them, Lord Jesus. Continue to encourage them to stay focused so that they can finish this degree, so that they can continue to impact life. And also, Lord, I just wanted to continue to bless Anthony's life, Lord, that he can continue to go out and bless other person's life. In the name sake, amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Great job. So, bye. Take care, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.